A Brazilian congressional committee is discussing the possible impeachment of Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff. Plus, Venezuelans commemorate the 14th anniversary of the failed coup against former President Hugo Chavez. Thanks so much for joining us. For Telesur English, I'm Cody Weddell in Caracas, Venezuela. This is from the South. Marches continue in Brazil in support of President Dilma Rousseff while the Congressional Committee is discussing her possible impeachment. Now, the vote that began today is largely symbolic because the Congress is set to vote anyway on April 17th on whether, whether to move forward with the impeachment process. Now, if Rousseff's opponents lock in a two-thirds majority, the question will then go to the Senate for another vote. Surveys by Brazilian media show her opponents have not secured two-thirds of the votes in the lower house to take her impeachment to the Senate. Venezuela is remembering the 14th anniversary of the attempted coup against the government of Hugo Chavez. On April 11, 20, 2002, right-wing groups, along with corporate groups and with the support of private media, organized a coup to try to overthrow President Hugo Chavez, the leader of the Bolivarian Revolution. Private media and the military high command falsely informed that Chavez had resigned. Now the coup ultimately failed, but dozens of people lost their lives. There was a rally here from April 10, 2002. On the 11th, people were coming to a march and also the opposition. The two marches never got to confront. What happened? That snipers down there began to shoot up towards the bridge, and the opposition was arming people, but the ones here in Puente Yaguno were unarmed, and those who fell down were those supporting the revolutionary process. It was 14 years ago here on the Puente Laguna that the failed coup against President Chavez began. Opposition marchers were moving along down there, the, the Chavisa marchers were up here. Snipers posted on the hotel up there began firing at both sides. 19 people died, many more were injured. And the media used images of Chavistas trying to defend themselves with handguns behind these walls to justify their attempt to remove President Chavez, which was over. Elections took place in Peru on Sunday. Now, one of the features has been the revival of the left in that country, which has not played a major role in politics since the 1980s. Our correspondent in the country now with the details. Elections took place in Peru last Sunday for president, Congress and Andean Parliament. No major irregularities were reported and the biggest obstacles were the long lines seen in many districts throughout the afternoon. Most voters interviewed expressed a sense of duty when giving opinions about the process. This is to do my duty as a citizen, and from here I have to go to work. Despite being a strange election, you can't lose hope. Onward for the country. I have been thinking about who to support. I'm analyzing the options. I have studied it in detail. The ultra-conservative presidential candidate Keiko Fujimori came in first and has secured a spot in the runoff. But as of Monday morning, results are not final on what candidate will accompany Fujimori. One of the candidates for the second spot is pro-market and corporate favorite Pedro Palo Kuczynski, who voted in a middle-class neighborhood of Lima. The other contestant is leftist Veronica Mendoza, who reinstated her party's commitment not to compromise their positions, whatever the results are. We're not going to give in. We cannot turn back or betray the people's hope for change. We believe that the issue we have placed on the table are non-negotiable. They are the minimum requirements we need as a country and as a society. With respect to the congressional elections, Fujimori's party will have around 60 seats, Kuczynski 25, Mendoza 22, and the remaining 13 will be divided among smaller parties. It is not clear when the agency in charge of counting the votes will submit the final results, but Telesur will be following closely for the latest news. Rael Mora, Telesur, Peru. A caravan for peace, life and justice reached Mexico City on Sunday. Now the caravan departed from Honduras on March 28th and has marched across Guatemala and Mexico. It's set to arrive in New York on the 18th to deliver a message to halt the war on drugs at a special UN commission. The caravan is formed by families of victims of human rights violations, civil society organizations and social movements from different nations. 
The intensity of heavy rains that have been falling over the Argentine coast in the last days has begun to decrease. At least 12,000 people in the uh, Entre Rios province were affected. Residents could begin to return to their homes after 12 hours of weather improvement. The rains have caused rivers to overflow their banks due to the blockage of the sewage. Some municipalities remain isolated. Peru has overtaken Bolivia as the leading exporter of quinoa to the United States for the first time. Bolivia's quinoa farmers say they're now struggling to make a living as the price of their quinoa exports has fallen by half over the last year. Our Bolivia correspondent now, Dimitri O'Donnells, with more. Valerio Mamani has been growing quinoa since he was 18. He's seen the phenomenal rise of the once humble crop that became a staple of health food stores around the world. Young farmers like Valerio turned most of their land over to cultivating quinoa to feed the growing global demand. But the boom years are over. Prices are falling and Bolivia's quinoa farmers fear prices will revert to pre-boom levels hitting their profits. We are worried. Why? What if the quinoa returns to what it was before, when the price for every 100 kilograms was 40 to 50 boliviano? If we go back to this price, bread costs almost 50 cents. I will no longer make enough money to cover my child's education and to support ourselves throughout the year. The high global demand for quinoa over the past decade has sent the price rocketing, tripling in value between 2006 and 2012. But this year, quinoa farmers have learned that an overdependence on one commodity is profitable only in the short term. They will have to diversify in the future, especially as countries like neighbouring Peru are ramping up production like never before. Peru is now the largest quinoa producer in the world. And in a double blow to Bolivia, the birthplace of quinoa, it also became the main exporter of the grain to the lucrative U.S. market. For Bolivia, the value of exports was nearly cut in half over the last year. Farmers in this sector at this time are devoting a lot to the quinoa. Despite the fall in the price, we can see hectares of quinoa production. Farmers are also facing environmental challenges. The effects of climate change and El Nino have hit production levels hard. When there is not much rain, this is what happens. Look, we don't have the same production. There is no quinoa. And when there is rain, it's good. Economists say while Bolivia is still a major player in the market, the government needs to expand into Asia and the Middle East to regain its place as the world's top producer of this so-called miracle crop. Dimitri O'Donnell, Telesur, Patacamaya, Bolivia. In the United States now, uh, President Barack Obama says that not properly planning for the aftermath of the overthrowing of the Libyan government was the worst mistake of his presidency. Now, this revelation came while being interviewed on Fox News about the highs and lows of his presidency. Since the toppling of the government of Muammar Gaddafi, Libya has descended into political chaos and also represents a growing extremist threat. Over 4,000 people have died in the ongoing fighting there. Terrorists getting their hands on a weapon of mass destruction. Earlier today, foreign ministers from the Group of Seven visited the Hiroshima Memorial in Japan. The memorial is the site of the world's first use of an atomic weapon in warfare. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry was the first sitting Secretary of State to visit that memorial. Hiroshima was devastated when the United States dropped an atomic bomb on the city. That was in August of 1945. British Prime Minister David Cameron faced his colleagues in Parliament for the first time since the rumblings over his family's tax affairs. Cameron defended the right to, quote, make money lawfully. He argued that artificially reducing tax should not be confused with legitimate enterprise and wealth creation schemes. During the session, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn said there was one rule for the rich and one other one for the rest. Speaker. We've gone through six years, six years of crushing austerity. Families lining up at food banks to feed their children. Disabled people losing their benefits. Elderly care cut and slashed. Living standards going down. Much of this could have been avoided if our country hadn't been ripped off by the super rich refusing to pay their taxes. 
The UN peace envoy to Syria has met with Foreign Minister Walid Mualam in the capital of Damascus. That was earlier today. During the meeting, UN peace envoy to Syria Staffan de Mistura said that an upcoming round of negotiations in Geneva aimed at ending the country's five-year war would be, quote, critically, critically important. De Mistura said he used the meeting to urge Damascus to support Syria's shaky truce and allow more humanitarian aid access. About 180 Yassidi and Kurdish refugees have left the Greek town of Idomini to new government-owned migrant centers. The move comes after Sunday's incident in which Macedonian police used tear gas and rubber bullets on refugees. Over 300 of the demonstrators were treated for injuries. Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras condemned the actions of the police. They attacked people that did not have guns, that were not a serious threat, with tear gas and rubber bullets. I want to say that this is a big disgrace for European civilization and for countries that want to be part of European civilization. Brussels has seen an increase in the number of deployed soldiers since the attack on its airport on March 22nd, but this is becoming difficult to maintain. According to the head of the military personnel union, this is due mainly to a lack of means and equipment. The union head has called on the Belgian government to take into account that the deployment is also taking a toll on the soldiers' personal lives. At least 12 people were killed and 38 more were wounded when a suicide bomber attacked a bus carrying Afghan army recruits. According to officials, the attacker was on a motorcycle when he rammed the bus, detonating explosives. The incident took place in Afghanistan's eastern city of Halabadab. The Taliban have claimed responsibility for that attack. And in the Gaza Strip now, the Islamic Jihad movement and Hamas have rallied in support of the infitada and detainees. More now with, the, with our correspondent, Noor Harazin. Marking the Palestinian Prisoner Day celebrated on the 17th of April, Hamas and the Islamic Jihad movements in the Gaza Strip rallied in front of the Red Cross headquarters in western Gaza City in support of Jerusalem's Intifada and the Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. Hamas spokesman Sami Abu Zuhri said that this movement is doing its utmost to guarantee the release of all the Palestinian detainees. The Hamas movement is taking the opportunity of Palestinian Prisoners' Day to shed the light on the issues of Palestinian prisoners locally and internationally in the light of their mounting suffering in the Israeli imprisonment. Hamas will use all possible means to ensure the release of all Palestinian detainees in Israeli prisons. About 7,000 Palestinians are being held in the Israeli jails, according to the Palestinian Prisoners Club. Nearly 1,900 of them are minors, double the figure from just six months ago. The report issued by Human Rights Watch Monday accused Israel of using unnecessary force in arresting Palestinian children. It also revealed that Israeli security forces treated children detainees in ways that would terrify and traumatize an adult. Analysts say that Israel has been systemically using detention as means to scare Palestinians in an attempt to kill the Intifada. Meanwhile, a high-ranking Israeli official stated Sunday that the number of attacks carried out by Palestinians against Israelis in the West Bank and Jerusalem has noticeably decreased. The official referred this decline to security activities by Israeli army against terror cells. He also concluded that the Palestinians might have learned that security tensions are unbeneficial to them and will eventually take them to nowhere. Nur Harazin, Telesu TV, Gaza. Former FIFA Vice President Alfredo Hawit has pleaded guilty in federal court in New York to four conspiracy charges stemming from a U.S. investigation of corruption into FIFA. How he pleaded guilty to racketeering and corruption charges related to the awarding of contracts for media and marketing rights to CONCACAF for their tournaments and FIFA World Cup matches. As part of his plea agreement, he will forfeit $950,000. And now we go to Ecuador's capital of Quito. That's where things are being put in place to introduce electric bikes, bicycles to users of its public bike sharing program, BC Quito. Now this initiative is part of the city's bid to curb traffic there. 
pollution, also to curb pollution and to promote healthy living in general. The new bicycles will be equipped with a lithium battery that is charged as riders pedal the bike. They will be available to the public from April 17th. And that's what we're covering on this Monday. Thanks so much for joining us. Be sure to follow us on social media as well on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here tomorrow.